Well, today I want to begin um, by giving you a little bit of up, an update on me. I don't like to, uh, certainly don't think it would be appropriate to consistently make myself the center of what happens here. I'm one member of many in this body, but I did want to let you guys know that uh, on Tuesday I'm going to be having surgery. Uh, if you paid attention over the last year, year and a half, um, I have been much fatter and much skinnier at some point, and so I've had a thyroid condition, and so on Tuesday I'm going to have my thyroid removed, and that means I will be out for two weeks. Now the good news about that is I can promise you that over the next two weeks, you're going to hear the best two sermons preached in this church that you will hear uh, through the rest of the year. They're going to, two guys that are absolutely fantastic, have a ton of confidence in both of them. You're going to get introduced to Nathan Jager. He's here somewhere today. Uh, if you get a chance, maybe you can meet him afterward. I got to share a small group with them when they were at a part of our church uh, a few years ago. Uh, they've now come back. He's an extraordinarily bright and talented guy. It will, it will literally be uh, the best sermon you've heard all year. So uh, make sure you're here for that next week. I have to take two weeks off of preaching due to the, uh, I guess, the proximity to my vocal cords. But um, just looking forward to being back with you just as soon as I can. So today I want to begin uh, our AMA series. This is Ask Me Anything, and what we get to do, and I think it's a lot of fun because we get to respond to specific questions that our church members have submitted. And so thank you to each of you who submitted a question for this series. I was a little bit caught off guard uh, by the, the question that I'm going to be addressing today because normally when you ask people questions, uh, they're going to throw like a gotcha question at you that's going to be brutally difficult for the pastor to answer. Uh, you know, they're like, hey, let's dig into Revelation, and I need real specifics. When's Jesus coming back? You know, you get a lot of that sort of thing, or you get very practical things like, hey, my marriage is broken. How do I fix it? And it's like, well, that's tough on a Sunday. Uh, but interestingly enough, today we got a topic that isn't related necessarily uh, to an individual or in their circumstances, and it's not really a gotcha question, but it's related to the nature and the character of God. And so I'm delighted that today we're going to discuss the Trinity, the question that we got, and it was more than one person asked, what is the Trinity? How do I understand it? And then why does it even matter? This doctrine of the Trinity. And so if you are not familiar with the Trinity, uh, if you haven't read that word in your Bible, you, you haven't missed it, uh, but rather the Trinity is a word that we use to describe the biblical teaching that God is, is one God who exists as three persons. I'll say it again, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, it's, it's basically the word or the phrase that we use to describe the fact that God is one God who exists as three persons. Now, as I was studying uh, this week, I came across uh, a quote from a man named Finney Asayuni. Uh, he is the pastor of City Church in Lagos, Nigeria. And as he began to talk about the Trinity, he said, hey, please bear this in mind. He said that something that is designed... Right, Whatever it is that's created is always going to be simpler um, than the designer. Let me say it this way. The designer is always more complex than that which is designed. And so uh, it's true for us in, in our lives when we're making, you're making a bologna sandwich. Um, no one's going to be able to look at a bologna sandwich and be like, oh, I understand the fullness and the intricacies of the person that created this. And that's true uh, whether it be of something you produce at work. It's true uh, if you've built a global business. That which is designed is always much substantially simpler than that which designed it. The designer is always far more complex than the thing that is designed. And so for many of us, we go about our lives wondering who God is and trying to understand God by looking at creation. And so we look at the world and we look back to history and we see how God has moved. And you think, why would God do that? And oftentimes we get offended by God because he didn't work in the ways that we should. And we, we look at creation, which just, just kind of gives us a sense of who God is, but doesn't define him. And sometimes we draw negative conclusions about who God is. Well, with regard to the doctrine of the Trinity and any other doctrine, I would point you not to look at what you see in the world, not to try to understand the complexity of our Creator from, by looking at the creation or how He's worked throughout history, but instead we're going to look into the Word of God. 
God has given us the scriptures. That's where he revealed himself to us explicitly that we might know him and who he is and how we should relate to him. And so we're going to spend some time in the scriptures today just because this is a, a doctrine that, that really spans the entire Bible. And so I'm going to have all the scriptures on the screens, but we're going to have to move rather quickly unless y'all want to have a late lunch. So I want to do my best to work through these things. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 1. In verse 26. And so if you're not uh, familiar with the doctrine of the Trinity, this three in oneness of God, uh, we're going to, I want to point out just a few places in the Bible that show us that God does indeed exist as one God in three persons. Now I'm going to have to develop this as we go. So just hang with me. Genesis chapter one, verse 26. If you were to start reading the Bible today, this is the first chapter, the first page. God is creating the heavens and the earth. And in 126, God says this, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And if you're reading the Bible, um, just about anyone at any level would think, well, that's really strange um, because we're monotheistic, right? We're Christians. There's, There's one God that we pray to, and yet here God is representing himself as an us, And he's talking about our image and our likeness. And so that should rightly give you pause. Like, what's going on here? If you were to read on Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, we see it again. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. This was after the fall. They ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And man has become like us. Now, if you were to read, continue on through the New Testament, you would see it uh, in in the Psalms and among the prophets, this uh, continued reference to God and as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And and you would probably wonder how all those things work together. Uh, But if you skip forward to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 3, it's the baptism of Jesus. You know, Jesus was sent by God. He came to earth as the Son of God to offer himself as a sacrifice for sins on the cross. And so, um, as he began his earthly ministry, he chose to be baptized. And this is Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, so this is Jesus, Son of God, right? When he was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And so, you have Jesus being baptized. The heavens open up. The Spirit of God is descending on him like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So you have Jesus, the Son of God, being baptized, the Spirit of God descending upon him, and God the Father being well pleased with his Son speaking from heaven. Again, this is the three in one nature of of God being illustrated for you in this text. Last week, we we talked a lot about missions and the Great Commission, and Jesus commissioned us as his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It continues on, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Peter is beginning his letter. This is his opening address. And he he begins, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia, in Asia and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So we have God the Father. In the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. And so as Peter opens his letter, we have this Trinitarian reference or reference to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, that might have seemed like a lot, but that's very, very brief, uh, a few mentions of God the Father, Son, and Spirit that we have throughout the Bible. And so today, I want to, to basically give you three core components to the doctrine of the Trinity, and then I want to I talk to you about why that matters for us and how the doctrine of the Trinity should shape us both as individuals and as a church body. Okay, so there are three essential components of biblical understanding of the Trinity. I'm going to run through these very quickly, and then we'll take them one at a time. The first component is that God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. The second is that each of those persons is fully God. 
The third, there is only one God. If it feels redundant, you'll understand why. Um, if you've studied much of church history and the wild heresies that were birthed uh, out of a misunderstanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, you'll understand why we're taking them this way. But let's, let's take the first. The first idea, that God exists in three distinct persons. Now, if you've been around church very long, you ever went to Sunday school, maybe even a vacation Bible school, you probably heard this is the analogy that people use a lot when talking about the Trinity. They say, well, it's kind of like water. And water can exist in three states. You have solid, when you know water is ice, and then you have liquid, which is what we drink, and then you have uh, vapor, the gaseous state of water. And so that's kind of how God is, right? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, that illustration actually teaches a heresy known as modalism. And modalism basically taught this, that in the Old Testament, God manifested himself as God the Father. And then early New Testament, all the way into about Acts, God manifested himself as God the Son in Jesus Christ. And then after that, God manifested himself as the Holy Spirit who empowers us for service. And yet that's, that's incorrect. Um, God is all three, all at the same time, and has been for eternity. God exists in three distinct persons all at the same time. Why do I tell you that? Well, we began in John chapter, or I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 1, where God uses the us and our language. Let us make man in our image. But if you look in John chapter 1 and verse 1, we see that it, it wasn't, well, we, we begin to see who the us was or the, the our image, who they were talking about. So in John chapter 1, verse 1, John begins and he says, in the beginning, the beginning, right? was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, if you, we don't have time to do this, but if you want to cheat down and read just a little bit further, you're going to see that in verses 9 through 18 of that same chapter, the Word is identified as Jesus. That's who he's talking about. And so in the beginning, it wasn't just God the Father doing the work, but we see that God the Son, Jesus Christ, was there in the beginning. He was with God, and he was God. But it wasn't just God the Father and God the Son in the beginning either. In John uh, chapter 17, verse 24, <clears throat> excuse me, it says this. I'm sorry, I'm talking about the distinction here. I'm getting ahead of myself. I apologize. This is Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, it wasn't just God the Father and God the Son there in the garden. Um, the Holy Spirit was also there. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says that the earth was, out, was without form and it was void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So who is the us? Who is the hour that God was referencing in Genesis chapter 1? Um, from the very beginning, we see Father and Son and Holy Spirit there. As a matter of fact, they have existed eternally, right? And they will continue to exist in eternity. God does not change. Uh, he's the same yesterday and today and forever. And so God has eternally existed as Father, Son, and Spirit. Three distinct beings. John 17, 24, Jesus says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. The world. You loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus is not, as the Jehovah's Witnesses might uh, try to tell you, a created being. As a matter of fact, they have a lot of trouble with John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, they actually do this really strange thing in the Greek where they're like, well, there's not a definite article there before God, and so uh, we can't say that Jesus was God, even though that's literally what it says. And then they, if you follow their logic, it messes everything up in John chapter 1. Um, but there has been this tendency to see Jesus as something other than God. And there is this difficulty of uh, kind of the humanity and the deity of Jesus is being merged in this fleshly person, Jesus was fully God. Three distinct persons, yet fully God. So again, uh, in John 17, 24, we see that God has given Jesus glory. We see that God has loved Jesus 
before the foundations of the world. And yet Jesus is praying to the Father. There's a distinction. One is bestowing glory on the other and bestowing love upon the other. In John 14, 26, Jesus tells us, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things to bring and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So again, Jesus is here teaching and telling us about God, the Father sending God, the Holy Spirit, who's going to be a helper to us. Again, there is a distinction between the three persons of um, the Trinity in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right? If you're unconvinced, we can have uh, lots of conversations. There's a lot to go through here, but point number one, God exists in three distinct persons. Point number two, each person of the Trinity is fully God. Now, almost nobody debates whether God the Father is fully God. Um, after all, I mean, it, it, God the Father is the, the God who loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's God the Father. He's in heaven. He's ruling and reigning. He sent His only begotten that we might uh, be saved through the work of Jesus Christ. And so um, almost nobody debates that God the Father is God. Um, and yet Matthew 6, 9, if you just need a little more scriptural evidence, Jesus is telling us to pray. And as we pray, we should pray to God the Father. He opens with our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name, the Lord's Prayer. We are praying to God the Father. So, God the Father is God, and then God the Son, Jesus. Was He fully God? Now, again, I, I told you that there are a tremendous amount of misunderstandings and even uh, heresies, if you love church history, that have arisen out of the idea that Jesus could not have been fully God when He came uh, to earth. And yet, he was. Again, we saw in John 1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. Uh, but if we continue on there, the Word was God. It says, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And so Jesus wasn't merely hanging out in the beginning at creation, but He was active in creating the world that we know and that we see. He was there before anything else was made. And it was by him and through him that all that we know and see were ultimately made. Jesus isn't like, you know, the little, little kid of God who, who doesn't really have any of his power. They got sent to suffer and die, but Jesus was fully God the whole time. His divine power was on display in creation. He shares all of God's attributes, his eternality, his omniscience, which means he's all-knowing, his omnipotence, he's all-powerful. Jesus shared all of that with God there's a, a little more of a personal illustration of this for us in the Scripture. If you're familiar with Thomas, one of the apostles, he was the one who doubted. And in John chapter 20, verses 24 through 28, it's a really interesting portrait of wrestling with faith before they'd seen the resurrected Christ. Here, here's what it says. Now Thomas one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with him when Jesus had came. So Jesus had appeared to some of the disciples, but Thomas hadn't seen him yet. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, Unless I see the, in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. If you're unconvinced about the significance of the resurrection, here is one of the 12 apostles who'd seen Jesus heal the sick, who'd seen him raise Lazarus, who'd seen his miraculous works, feed the 5,000, walk on the water. And when he died, Thomas was so convinced that he must not be God that he was like, I, I will not believe it until I see the marks in his hands and the hole in his side. So eight days later, Jesus is like, oh, you want to see? The disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And knowing that little bit of doubt that was in Thomas's heart, he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, 
He's speaking to Jesus here. He says, my Lord and my God. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Thomas came to understand that he wasn't just a man. This was Thomas who had deserted Jesus when he was arrested. When he saw the resurrected Christ, when he touched the holes in his hands and his side, he declares, my Lord and my God, Jesus was fully God. Then the final piece here, the Holy Spirit is fully God. There's an account in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. It's the account of Ananias and Sapphira. It says, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira, they sold a piece of property, and with the wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And so what Peter did there is he equated lying to the Holy Spirit with lying to God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are fully God who exist in three distinct persons. All right, and then the final piece before we kind of get into practically what this means for us is there is only one God. If you were a good Jew, perhaps the first verse you would be taught, not John 3.16 like most of us learn, uh, but it would actually be in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's what's known as the Shema. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5, they say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love this one God. Love the Lord with you, your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your might. From beginning to end, the scriptures are clear. There is one God. Isaiah 45, 5. I am the Lord and there is no other besides me. There is no God. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. There is only one God. James 2, 19. James pointing out the Shema here. He's referencing Deuteronomy uh, 6. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Even the demons recognize that there's only one God who exists in three distinct persons who are all fully God. So those are kind of the key tenets of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, you're going to see distinctions in their roles and how they relate to one another. They are all fully God. They all share the attributes of God. Um, so why does this matter? Because we've spent a lot of time and covered a lot of ground uh, scripturally. Why does this even matter to us as the church, as the people of God? If you're here and you're an unbeliever and you're thinking, this sounds insane, why would you even you know, bring this up on a Sunday? Well, here's why it matters. Number one, it helps us rightly understand who God is and how we should relate to Him. Uh, one of the questions that got sent in, and I thought it was really fantastic, um, was, uh, if the Trinity is real, should we make sure that we're careful to pray to God the Father and then God the Son and then God the Holy Spirit? Because, I mean, if we're being honest, uh, sometimes we're, we're old school Baptists, right? Sometimes it feels like we don't give the Spirit enough credit, like he's the kid that never gets picked for the team. We never pray to him. We don't focus on him enough. And if the doctrine of the Trinity would, would tell us that if you are praying to Father, Son, or Spirit, you are praying to the same God. The Holy Spirit isn't sitting outside feeling left out like no one's participating. He is God. And when you're praying to God, you've been praying to Him, and that's been true since the very beginning. Now, there is some beauty in us dis understanding, though, the distinction of the Trinity. It was God the Father who saw us in our sin and sent His only begotten Son to die that whosoever would believe in him, we wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. In Jesus, it was God the Son who took on flesh and became obedient even to the point of death. 
there in the garden knowing what he endured. Father, not my will but yours be done. He submitted to the beating and the mocking, the nails in his hands and his ankles, the agony of the cross. The Son did that for us. The Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells within you and within me as believers in Jesus Christ, those who have been saved by grace through faith, that same Spirit which raised Christ from the dead now dwells in us. Listen, we have power via the Holy Spirit to live victorious lives and to experience all the fullness that God has for us, that full and abundant life. It is available to us through the same power of the Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And so it's important for us to understand the doctrine of the Trinity. It helps us understand God and how we should relate to Him. But it's not just that. It also helps us understand how we should relate to one another. You remember the first verse I mentioned today? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make God in our image. And I told you that every person of the Trinity, they all have all the divine attributes. Perfectly loving. There's no self-centeredness or selfishness within the Trinity of God, this perfect unity that exists. But rather, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they're not each seeking their own, but rather they're seeking the good of the others in this beautiful unity. And so God did not create the world because he's like, you know, I'm kind of lonely. I need some people to worship me. God was triune from eternity and perfectly self-sufficient in Father, Son, and Spirit, all loving and giving and serving to one another, glorifying one another. We see it throughout Scripture. God didn't make us so that we could, you know, cheerlead Him along the way, but rather God, who is divine and existed in three persons who all perfectly loved and served and glorified one another. He created us that we might share in his divine attributes, that we might know that perfect love, that he might demonstrate his self-giving nature to us and that we might experience the same fullness of life that God experienced within himself. So God created us to share himself with us. And we see it beautifully displayed as Jesus took on flesh for sinful men and women like ourselves who had rebelled against him and gone our own way, God the Father sees us in our sin and he sends his son Jesus to suffer the agony of death that we deserved so that our sins might be taken away, that we might be forgiven, that we might be reconciled to him where we could see how much, the love, uh, how much God loves us. And he sent his Holy Spirit that we could live in this fullness and richness of life. Not a life that's centered on ourselves anymore. Not a life that says it's all about me and my glory and getting what I can. But Jesus is like, I want you to know the life which is full and abundant. The richest, fullest, most satisfying life you can live. And it's not the one focused on you, but rather it mimics what happened there in the Trinity. But rather than any part focusing on itself, there's this beautiful unity formed. And we take our eyes off of ourselves. And we choose to love one another, to give ourselves to one another, to seek not our own glory, but to seek the glory of another. If you want to know the fullest, richest, most satisfying life that you can ever live, it's the life that reflects the Trinitarian relationship of God. Perfectly loving, serving, giving, offering ourselves in service to one another, the church should be a picture of the Trinity. As we offer ourselves to each other, serving and caring and loving. And just as God the Father sent God the Son into the world, and just as Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to live within those who are saved by grace through faith, so we too have been sent as a continuation of God's mission in this world to make this extraordinary God known through the way that we offer ourselves to one another. The Trinity is indeed a difficult doctrine. It's 
figure it out. I absolutely can't do it. I can't handle eternality either. It's, it's beyond me. And yet we're reminded that the designer is infinitely more complex than that which is designed. And we as God's created beings shouldn't be shocked when we can't necessarily discern the fullness of who our creator is. But we have this beautiful doctrine revealed to us in scripture. This beauty of God's relationship, the self-giving nature of who God is. And that's plenty enough for us to strive toward and to make us worship. Would you bow with me? Father, I do thank you for a church who cares enough to ask, who is God? What's he like and how should I relate to him? And Lord, I do pray that you would continue to lead us into fullness of understanding as we seek to know your glory, to know how good you are. And Father, I pray that we would reflect that glory as the church of Jesus Christ, that the world would take notice of how we love one another and how we don't live selfish, self-centered lives, but instead how we give ourselves away. And God, when, when they ask that we might point them to our Father in heaven, We give because of the way that you've given to us. We serve because of the way that you served us. God, we love other people because of the way that you loved us. Lord, we praise you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, um, if you're here and you haven't come to know this perfect love that God, with which God loved you, you haven't experience the forgiveness and the richness available to you through a relationship with God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, I would love to share with you about the gospel and what it means for you, about how much God loved you. I'll, I'll be right down here. You can grab me after. Uh, we're going to have a time of response. I'm going to invite you to stand and, and just encourage you to respond in obedience to Jesus um, if you're here today and um, you know Jesus Christ. But maybe you've been discounting the power of His Spirit in your life. Maybe you've forgotten that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells within you. And this is a time for you to turn your attention back to God in worship, to, to cry out to God to rescue you from the sin that you've been walking in, to give you that fullness of joy that you have in uh, via the Holy Spirit of God. So this time, would you just respond in obedience to God and to the truth that we have in His Word?